Hi, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. This week I thought we'd talk about the art of a good closing track. Approaching the end of the record you're listening to often feels like watching a film. You're willing the artist to go out on a high note, not literally a high note obviously, but end on a proper quality note that will make you think about the record more and make you want to return to it. It might be pulling out one final trick, be that a heart-wrenching swooning full stop or the last raggedy throwdown, something that will throw you for a loop and surprise you. Equally it could be something that just cements that artist's voice to you. A track which epitomises everything you've listened to up until that point. And I think a really memorable closing track can have a genuine effect on your relationship with that record and how many times you may return to it after a first listen. How many times have you listened to a record where you thought that the first half of the record is front loaded with tracks, it's varied, fluid, you can't get enough of it. But in the second half, or side B for you vinyl heads, you find your attention wandering a little bit, you're looking around, you're noticing how dirty your floor is, oh maybe I need to go and put out the washing. If the final track of a record isn't properly utilised by an artist, it may stop me from returning to that record and listening to it in full again. If I only liked a handful of tracks on side A, I might just put those into a playlist and never really return to the back half of that record again. It's integral that they pull off that finish in the in the interesting way, in a compelling way. If you're an artist that cares about the value of the record, as in a series of tracks from start to finish that you hope a listener will listen to in that order, then it's really important that you pull off that final track and give the listener what they need in those final moments. Like, why are you an artist that deserves to be listened to? Oh, this is why, because I can create a varied, interesting record at the beginning and I can pull it off in those final closing moments. And it, and it ensures me as a listener that everything feels vital, because you've thought about that last track. It hasn't just been thrown on last minute because you couldn't think of how to end the record. It's been thought about and it's part of that journey. Now of course if it's a concept album it's all the more obvious this idea. You know if you've got a narrative thread weaving through your record you're telling a story. Well the conventions of storytelling are you want it probably to end in some kind of interesting way right? Otherwise you sort of maybe feel let down by the journey you've gone on up until that point. If you've managed to carry an audience along with you on a journey where they're invested in it, then you're going to want them to feel like there's some sort of payoff at the end. Unless, of course, petering out is somehow emblematic of the story you've been telling in the first place. You know, sometimes that works for stories, but generally you want the record, you want the story to end in some kind of meaningful way that reflects the rest of the narrative. Case in point, let's look at the brilliant A Grand Don't Come For Free, the second record by Mike Skinner, aka The Streets. For those who haven't listened to the record, spoiler alert, the narrative follows Mike, a guy a bit down on his luck, who loses a thousand quid at the beginning of the record. A quid is a, a grand or a thousand pounds for those of you who aren't in Britain. Um, he gets in a relationship with Simone, he fucks it up, he finds out his friend Dan is sleeping with Simone, he loses Simone, and then we get to the final track of the record, Empty Cans. Skinner brilliantly plays with the deceptively simple narrative in this final moment. You know, the narrative is not complex or difficult to understand. And you know, he, he, he plays with that idea in this final track, showing how life can take a different turn depending on your outlook as a person. You know, we have the character of Mike sat there on the sofa, pissed off at the world, gets in a fight with the TV repairman, and generally not having a good time of it at all. But then Skinner rewinds the narrative and we get an alternative version of events. This time Mike is sat at home but he's friendly with the TV repair guy. The TV repair guy finds his a thousand pounds. He thinks about the things that he's done to people and not just things that have been done to him. He learns something from his experiences and it makes it such an emotionally fulfilling finale. And during this, instrumentally, Skinner reflects the negative, positive dichotomy with that paranoia of the first half of the record replaced with very positive, ascending chords and emotive string synths. I cannot tell you how many times I've shed a tear listening to this track, primarily because it really fulfills something that the narrative was leading to. It builds on what we've already heard before and it's a pitch perfect way of delivering that conclusion that you were hoping for. Basically it makes me want to take the journey all over again so I can experience that finale once again. You know there's no better feeling for a closing track to be able to give to a listener than oh my god I need to listen to this again because the record's been great and this finale really capped it off in the most perfect way. We did a listening party for it a couple of weeks ago and once again the tears were rolling so I just loved it. I think it's a it's a beautiful piece of work. Great example of a brilliant closing track. Magnificent. 
Sticking with the idea at the moment of delivering an emotional gut punch of a finale, it of course doesn't always have to be connected narratively. You can still deliver an emotional finale without there being a narrative thread throughout the record. And there are countless records that I can think of that, that attempt to deliver that poignancy in the final moments. They twist that knife in the closing moments and hopefully try and leave the listener feeling bruised. A relatively recent example I can think of would be Borrowed Light, the final track from Perfume Genius's most recent record. Another kind of obvious finale like that is Hurt by Nine Inch Nails from The Downward Spiral. Or that otherworldly finale All Is Full Of Love from Yerk's Homogenic. Or Chrome County from OPN's R Plus Seven, which yeah, feels like the sun breaking through the clouds finally and you're basking in the warmth of it and we get those incredibly beautiful organ sequences right at the end that just take your breath away. As a side note, I heard it being used in an advert for fucking Britbox, which is some shit new iPlayer British TV Netflix thing, which definitely took something away from me. Please don't use any more of OPN stuff in adverts, please. What I find interesting is that some artists try and pull off this emotional finale, but it doesn't quite work. It comes across as almost a little bit emotionally manipulative or a little bit hackneyed, like you didn't know how to end the record, so you've decided to end on the cliche emotive closer. And sometimes that is how it comes across as a listener. Oh, it's the final track. Here comes the piano ballad again. Sometimes Sometimes it just doesn't suit the vibe of the record or it ends up coming off a little bit creatively barren to decide to end your record in that kind of obvious way. I'm thinking of something like Here, the final track off of David Byrne's record American Utopia. The wash of ambience and the slide guitar felt like an obvious way to close the record. Granted, on subsequent listens, I haven't massively enjoyed the record anyway, so that may have affected my feeling on the finale, but I always got the sense of, as you lead towards the end, oh, we know how this record's gonna end, and lo, it does, and I think that's a bit of a shame. Uh, obviously, granted, that's depending subject subjectively on whether you enjoyed that record or not to how you feel about the finale. But for me, that's one of those examples where I think uh, I knew that was coming and it did. And therefore, I don't feel surprised and, and not that impressed. And that's why the subjectivity of art is so much fun and why we get to have arguments all the time about things we like and hate. Think about how post-rock legend Slint ended their already unorthodox record, Spiderland, with this tale, this haunted shipwreck tale based on Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And it feels entirely unto itself, although still connected to the tracks that came before it. And the finale of that track, which is Good Morning Captain, you have Brian McMahon screaming, I miss you, throwing up from straining over how loud those high gain guitars are. I mean, it's a world away from a cliched or hackneyed ending. And I think that that finale specifically, it really has, it's epitomized everything that's so brilliant about ending a record on, on, a, on a real climactic way. It's something that's that's unusual, unexpected perhaps. I mean, it's, it's such an amazing ending and I, so many people will mention this when they talk about favorite closing tracks of a record. It's completely justified. If you haven't heard it, you need to have a listen. Often the best way to go out is with the pulsing energy that you were maintaining throughout the entire record before that. And if that's what you've been pumping out to the listener for the duration, then just keep on doing it. Keep punching them in the face. Leave them breathless until the record eventually drops out to that silence. I mean, this might be a fairly obvious example, but Lightning Bolt decided to end their 2003 record, Wonderful Rainbow, with this bass leaden track, Jewel in the Deep, which is a track which threatens to disintegrate any pair of headphones or speakers that go near it. Side note, we're listening to this record this week on the Deep us Discord. Links in the description if you want to come and listen with us. I think if this excellent noise rock record had ended on anything other than a brutal onslaught, it would have just felt a little bit odd. In a different way, Jeff Rosenstock's 2016 record Worry crashes out on the final track Perfect Sound Whatever, which follows this masterful suite of quick tracks that it maintain that consistent energy. It almost feels like this punk rock musical. No, not like American Idiot the Musical. Fuck off. That propulsive energy maintained through to the last second leaves the listener very satisfied, maybe a little breathless, and eager to jump in once again. And even though it fades out, which I don't always like, sometimes a fade out feels like a cop out, it, uh, it's fair enough, it works here. I'll let him have it. It might, might have been nice to just crash out on a final note and go out into silence, but it's a, it's a fade. I mean, whatever. <laughs> especially with debut records, sometimes taking a slight left field turn for the last track gives the listeners a hint of what they can expect 
in the subsequent releases, the things that the band are working towards and how their sound might change in the future. I loved Let's Eat Grandma's 2018 record I'm All Ears, partly for this reason. It's a pop record with real creative flair, but it ends on an 11 minute track Donnie Darko, which takes those tight structures that were forming the rest of the record and it, me it allows it to be a bit more of a meandering beauty of a track. And I wonder where they're gonna go with their next record. It, is a lot of their sound gonna now revolve around this? Because they really honed in on something very interesting on that final track. So was it like an outtake or was it something that we can come to expect from their future releases? I mean, I personally hope so, but it certainly creates a bit of intrigue. Or Fugazi's Repeater, you know, an absolute belter of a post-hardcore record from one of the best bands ever. I mean, if you haven't listened to Fugazi at this point, go and do it. This is their debut record and it ends on the track Shut the Door, which adds more space in the mix between the instruments. It's a bit more experimental and it, it hints at what the band would come to sound like in future records like Red Medicine. It's a neat way of winking at fans and saying, here's what you've got to look forward to. Even if it's an unconscious thing, and this is just, let's just try this sound out at the end of the record and see how people take it. I'll return to David Byrne again for a sec, this time on a slightly more positive note, because another approach to End Your Record, completely opposite to that overall emotional finale, is something quite uplifting, something that will leave the listener with a spring in their step. A lilting, uplifting track to say goodbye on. Can you name a track that does this better than This Must Be The Place from Talking Heads Speaking In Tongues? Oh, I can never listen to that track just once, I have to listen to it twice, three times, four times. It's one of the best examples of establishing equilibrium. It's centering the listener, it gives them a reassuring hug and tells them everything's gonna be okay, even if it seems like it's not. Byrne said in an interview that these lyrics are the most direct lyrics about love that he'd ever written, but not in a way that tries to suck all the emotion from the listener that it possibly can, like some of those examples of, of overall endings that don't always work. You know, in the way it feels like your empathy's being squeezed out with a piano finale with intense synths and strings, it just doesn't always quite land. It's a nuanced, pretty, kind of understated way of ending a record and, and yet it makes the most perfect album ending and actually has become one of those songs that, that Talking Heads are known for, especially by people who don't actually listen to Talking Heads all that much. But what do you guys think? What are your favourite album closers? I want to get loads of examples together on this video and find out what people's favourite favorite album endings are and maybe we'll listen to them. Maybe I'll do a follow-up video where I list some of the community's favourites because I think it's really interesting to, to discuss how different artists approach that, that coda, that final moment of a record. Thank you for watching as always. I'll be back soon with more Bits and Bobs, Nine Inch Nails Guide for one of them, lots of other things as well. Uh, please come and join us on the Deep Cuts Discord for listening parties as always tonight and on Thursday. The link's in the description. See you soon.